on to the next session now. The next session is called the Modern Workplace Panel. And in this session, we will talk about the new normal, the trends that we're going to look out for, and the future of workplaces to come. Thank you, Archana and team at Ascent. Good morning, good afternoon. Welcome to a fantastic session on the modern workplace. I'm joined by four phenomenal colleagues from, from all around the world, at least all around India. We've got Delhi, Mumbai, Bangalore, and the exotic location of Maldives online. Uh, we'll leave you to judge who is actually in who, in which place. Uh, now, as you go to the modern workplace, many people will say that actually every morning now, I'm supposedly working up, waking up in my modern workplace, which happens to be now my bedroom. Uh, and so to help us, you know, essentially look at what are some of the key trends, what's going to last beyond the pandemic, what is going to actually endure from through this, through this entire, you know, last nine months, which have been so different from what we've ever seen before. I'm going to actually, join, you know, ask a few questions to my four uh, co-hosts, and then we will actually open it up to questions. So if you have questions, please send it in, chat group, uh, and we will try our best to answer it. So I'm going to open it up with a question to all four of the panelists, which is, what is the one thing that has actually surprised you the most in the last sort of nine months? And what is the one leadership or personal trait that, uh, that you've developed during this pandemic? I'll ask you to go and then Sanjeev and then Ananya and Harsh, I'll leave the last word to you. Sure. Um, uh, thanks, uh, Nishab. One of the, I think, surprising element that I thought was, you know, for longest periods of decades, I have seen two different personas. One is of a professional persona that you carry to our office at 9 a.m. and finish that persona at 6 p.m. And then we have our private persona, the family man that we are, and our friends and social network. If ever, uh, I was surprised to see how these two blended during this work from home times. People opened up their bedrooms, their houses, to their customers, to their partners, and to their entire office colleagues. And I think I was surprised with ease with which people transitioned. Maybe forced, but nobody forces you to switch on the camera or introduce a baby playing. So that's the surprise part of it. Um, it's a, in a good sense. Uh, it's a present surprise. On, the, on leadership, I think if cooking doesn't count, I guess, but um, the trait that I learned really was uh, I was working on executive presence and how to build that. But what I found out was that my executive presence was severely diminished, like all of us, when I was not in a stage sitting and working on a home or a chair and talking to you instead of being in the stage. So I worked on the virtual, building my executive presence over virtually. I don't know whether it's working or not, but at least that is one area where I started working on. Fantastic. Thank you, Tamal. Building a virtual presence, I'm sure that's very important. A lot of people have called this, by the way, a waste-up economy. Uh, so I won't ask any of my guests to stand up. Sanjeev is in a suit. Sanjeev, I hope you're in shorts underneath that. But go ahead. Why don't you maybe ask? Uh, I, I, know. Not sure. I could be wearing shorts uh, below my waist. You don't know, right? I think and I won't talk about all the bad news, the people who fell ill, the people who passed away, the, the migrant labor who suffered a lot the job losses. I think we know all that. But the one thing that was a positive surprise with me was the ability of people, society, organizations to adapt. When the lockdown happened, right? So we are a company where uh, Q4 is our biggest quarter, right? And the last 10 days of every quarter is the, where you're going to a large part of the sales of that quarter, a collection of that quarter, right? Uh, that's the way the sales pattern is. So when March 20th, you lock down, you lose the largest part of your sale in your biggest quarter, right? And that was a, a fair blow. I mean, you know, we lost about 60, 70 crores of billing, okay? Which for a company our size is significant, you know? It's about seven, eight percent maybe maybe 6%, right? And then we're locked down, right? So at that stage, the kind of uh, scenario planning we're doing is, okay, if there is zero revenue for a year, what happens? How much cash do we have, you know, if there is zero, even three years, you know, and we did all sorts of stress testing, right? And you prepared for the worst. But what pleasantly surprised me was that how the first quarter was bad. My lockdown was there was bad. Uh, we were 44% down 
YOY on, on billings. But the bounce back of that has been encouraging. Right? And more importantly, you know, we switched to work from home pretty seamlessly. We're still working from home. We have not opened a single office. And I never thought we would be able to work from home the way we have been. So if you'd asked me a year ago, what's your view on work? We did not have work from home policy. You had to come to office. Because we were great believers in line of sight, teamwork, being there, physical presence, face to face, backslapping, having coffee together, going out for lunch together. You know, we were great believers in that. Maybe it's my age that, you know, that's how it was when... Um, I began my work, my career in 84. And uh, so we never, ever had any work from policy. Suddenly we're completely working from home and we are, we're doing well. So in fact, prior to COVID, the average sales guy would do two, maybe three sales meetings a day. Because you got to commute, you got to wait at the reception, you get into the conference room, then the guy comes, then you have a rich look tea and coffee and you begin talking after 15, 20 minutes, the real business. And if you've gone all the way from Nadia to Gurgaon, then you know you want to get at least 45 minutes face to face time. Right? Maybe one hour if you're lucky. Right? Now, the sales guys are doing 11 to 12 sales meetings a day because it's remote. You can do it in 20 minutes. There are no rituals. Of course, business may or may not be happening because, you know, hiring may be down or sluggish, but productivity is very high in terms of activity. Right? I never expected that. Clients also don't want you to come over even if they're open because they, they don't want to take a risk. And they're very happy to do video meetings. There was massive resistance to video conference and video meetings in our kind of company earlier because we are a face-to-face -face company always have been. We are not in, uh, you know, 70 countries globally where you're collaborating with teams, which are, you know, uh, in, 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 in six countries and, you know, uh, and, and you're doing a video conference at 2 a.m. to get, you know, because that's when you get time with everybody. Uh, we're not that kind of company. But for us to switch to video conferencing all the time, you know, Zoom meetings or, you know, uh, whichever platform you want to use, Microsoft Teams we use, right, uh, it was a big, big revelation. I mean, that, that, and I'm seeing it in organization after organization, they've adapted they adapted so well. So, you know, what happened in our company was that we got wind of COVID slightly early in the sense that the day, so I'm slightly paranoid, right? Uh, when the day I saw the first video out of Wuhan, I began to track it. And then within a week, this is around Jan, I think, I, you know, put somebody out of the CSR team and said, you're doing CSR for the next two, three months. You're tracking this thing on a daily basis and you're going to give me data. So this girl would give me data every day and we, you know, we watch it progress. Now, one of senior colleagues, uh, his wife was cabin crew in that Air India flight that came from Milan, which carried the first case, uh, which was uh, publicized, where the guy went to the Hyatt Hotel in Delhi and then Agra and then Noida. So his wife was in that flight uh, and she was told to quarantine. So he called us up and said, you know, we, I think I should also quarantine. And that's when he said, okay, it's uh, getting closer. And we actually moved to work from home two weeks before the lockdown, right? So March 21st was lockdown. We were working from home March 10th. Said, Let's do it. Because if, it's, if we have to suddenly lock down, we may not have enough time to switch. And we were able to do it. So I think that was a pleasant surprise. Uh, and it's not just us, many companies. The one trait that I have picked up inadvertently without trying, uh, subconsciously, and I now when you, only when you ask me this question did I ask myself that question. I, you know, I have learned to let go. I mean, I, I, I used to, I felt that I had a problem delegate. But, uh, you know, I was a great believer in face-to-face -face meeting, line of sight, you know. But now if I'm not there, work is happening, you know, and I'm willing to live with that. Okay. Um, and, you know, just, just do a check once or twice a week. Like, uh, did it happen? What's happening there? What's happening here? You know, uh, and not do it face to face. But, you know, I don't think this is sustainable for, for a year or two. I don't think it's sustainable because ultimately people are social animals and they will want face to face at least enough of it. So, but, but yeah, right now that's where I am. All right. Learning to let go on that topic. Ananya, you've been in multiple roles started in McKinsey, then Mintra, then uh, of course now with KKR Capstone. What's what's the thing that surprised you the most and what have you learned in the last nine months? Yeah, so I think I'll actually take off for, from what Sanjeev was saying, right? I think what surprised me the most was how the speed of execution actually went up instead of down in the last nine months. And I think a little bit to the salesperson example that Sanjeev was talking about, right? I think what I was... Uh, very pleasantly surprised by is one is because of COVID, I think the psychological barrier went away. People started challenging all holy cows. Sometimes execution used to get delayed because uh, leaders used to ask the question of, oh, but it'll never work. But I think once they saw COVID hit and they saw that the world can change in a, in a week, right? Um, I think most leaders went back and started challenging the holy cows. I think that was one. And the second was, uh, you know, just meetings that would get delayed because people were out of town and you would say, let's meet in person, let's do this discussion three weeks out. 
now you could schedule them literally at a four hour notice because everybody was at home and available of course that's come at a cost to many employees of work life balance but i think from a corporate perspective what pleasantly surprised me is that the speed of execution across companies over the last 9 months has gone down or uh, gone up not down i think that's one i think your second um, question or share of the leadership uh, trait right i was reflecting i think it was a great question again i hadn't spent time thinking about it and i think the biggest thing for me is you know i've learned to focus on the inputs even more than i used to and not so much on the output you know uh, we as kkr have the privilege of being partners with uh, companies which are in education in healthcare in waste management these companies could not miss a single day of operating because you you were at the front line right we, covid waste had to get picked up covid patients had to get delivered and i think at that point all what all of us could focus on doing including the management and companies was to make sure we focus on the inputs we do the right thing rather than worry on the business outcomes and i think that uh, trait has actually held up pretty well again you know as we are all seeing things are bouncing back in some cases much better than we'd anticipated so i think yeah that's that's my that's been my big learning which is focus on the inputs and the outputs will follow fantastic Harsh, in many ways, you are a dream job for for many people on this on this VC on this uh, on this international Zoom call. Uh, what surprised you, and what have you learned? Thanks, Harsh. Yeah, I mean, uh, I can't I can't complain. I I work in gaming, sports, and tech. Those are my three passions, so can't complain. Yeah, but I think what surprised me really is that uh, similar to what actually Sanjeev ji said that we we've been I've been um, steadfast against work from home in general i believe in physically interacting with people building a culture and doing all of that and i think what surprised me is that earlier during an ipl we would always have this you know take your leaves before ipl because during ipl everyone's in lockdown mode in office right and then we went ahead during lockdown and actually took the sponsorship rights for dream 11 ipl and even in dream 11 ipl for the first time which was our biggest ipl ever everyone was worked from home so we continued to work from home from march 15th till date and we've basically announced that we're going on till at least next till the following march right so one year work from home has surprised the hell out of me that we can survive we can thrive we can continue working but i think on the negative side it did also it did also convince me even more that culture completely takes a beating and that working from home we all become mercenaries right to the flip side of the you know 20 minute meetings instead of the one hour meetings is that you get in it's like kaam ki baat karo and you get out right there's no hi hello there's no water cooler conversation there's no chit chat and it's just meeting after meeting after meeting right and i think it it takes a big toll on people and um, i think on the leadership part it's a great question i think um, this pandemic has forced us as an organization as a growing organization right we're still we you know we were about 400 people before the pandemic and as a growing organization we've been forced to structure things a lot more so you know this has allowed me to take on more of a leadership role of delegation structure processes systems for a company that was very used to like being dynamic and on the go agile is all good but you have to have more systems in place so i think that's the new leadership trait i've been working on that's it i'm going to actually come back to you in the main question round with with the point on culture because i think it is so key but uh, sanjeev i'll start with you in a, and so now we'll we we'll just you know I have a few questions going back and forth between different people and please feel free to jump in anytime you want uh, if you agree with something you disagree with something anything so sanjeev i'm going to start with you you know you know i think hart said it anuya said it kanal also kanal also said it which is this there's been some structural shifts in how we work right now which are you know some would say enduring and some would say passing right but do you, you think about just not just work from home work from office but this whole you know part time versus full time employee you see gig economy exploding you see you know all kinds of you know um both positive very positive because we are seeing new people entering the workforce which are very different from where we did in the past so as you look from your vantage point what are going to be some of these 
enduring shifts in the workplace of the future that you think is going to stay as a result of this pandemic? So I think it depends, right, on how long and in what manner COVID recedes. Let's say the vaccine is out by Jan, uh, you got 200 million doses by Feb, get to most of the people by July, August. I think business will be back pretty much to normal work because people don't change so easily, right? Having said that, there will be more acceptance of uh, video meetings. There'll be more acceptance of some work from home. And uh, there will be some organizations which essentially are, you know, I mean, a lot of their profit depend on cost control, right? And they will say, hey, can I give up some real estate and reduce the cost? And if so, can I sort of have some people who are permanently work from home or can I have some people who are uh, work from home three days a week, right? But look, the thing that Harsh pointed out that culture, you can't build culture over video, right? You cannot have a situation where you ask a guy, what's the culture in your company? Well, you know, I don't know. I haven't met any of my colleagues for the last five years. It doesn't work. How on earth do you induct a management trainee or a engineering trainee? Now, you know, we are fortunate that we are profitable, we have enough cash and we have high enough margin and we're negative working capital. So we didn't sack anybody. We didn't withdraw a single offer that was made. We onboarded 87 engineers in the middle of COVID, freshers from, from campuses. So we did not even withdraw a single offer from which we made on campuses. We said we should honor our commitments if we can, which we could. So we did. But, you know, on an ongoing, I mean, how on earth can a supervisor uh, work with a graduate engineering trainee uh, without peering over his shoulder and without sort of getting in a room together and, you know, evaluating his work, right? Th these are new work methods. So it's going to be hard, right? Ultimately, you know, you MBWA thing still works. You know, management walking about, it still works. And that's how you build rapport. That's how you build relationships. And organizations are about good people having good relationships and working together. Um, and therefore, I think there will be some change, but it will not be uh, crazy sweeping change. You know, it will not be revolutionary. It will be evolutionary. Well, I think, you know, for many of us who have our offices in China, uh, I think that bears uh, the truth, which is, you know, many of us report our uh, China offices are virtually back to normal, of course, taking precautions and, and, uh, and you know, uh, social distancing and so on. But uh, people are actually back in the offices. And so yeah. it goes to so point if, that there will if be you can, If you can go back to the old ways, you will go back to the old ways, but with some adaptations. I want to come back to you because this question of culture is so important, right? So if you if you could describe the culture you are trying to strive for in Dream 11 in a few words of your own and sort of what, what do you personally do to try to bring that culture to life in a virtual world? Sure, I think, you know, Noshir, a lot of people, um, look, uh, I can only speak from our experience of culture. We take culture very, very seriously. We truly believe that culture is the only thing that scales. If you have a great culture in the organization, you'll hire great people. They'll perform beyond their expectations and they'll get people who they believe and trust and can work with to come and join you. And they'll do things beyond your expectations. But I think that the mistake we made early on, which we fixed about five years ago, was to actually write down what culture is. We always had an idea of what culture was and I think until we were about 30, 40 people, everyone knew, right? But as soon as we started scaling up, we said that, okay, we need to write this down because it wasn't very, very clear for the next 50 people. And that's when we wrote down, you know, 11 or 12 facets because it was dream 11, right? So we went with 11. And then from 11, six months later, even I didn't remember all 11. So we went on to eight. And then six months later, I didn't remember, like I remembered seven out of eight of them. And then we went down to five and then we made an acronym, which was that do put our culture first, which was data, ownership, performance, user first and transparency. And then we started driving that culture from hiring to appraisals to firing. Like literally, we don't do appraisals anymore at Dream11. You are just paid top of market based on what your peer feedback is on these five facets. Your hiring is based on these five facets. And so, you know, you can't just call, you can't just say culture, culture, culture. You have to actually drive it in the organization as your DNA. And so we have a lot of different things. Like at some point we said that, okay, we don't want to sit in our ivory tower and decide what are the benefits, perks, what kind of culture we're setting. So we created 10% of the workforce as a culture club. And we said, all of y'all decide 
what to do for our culture i think the last thing i like to say is that people also they mistake benefits and perks right benefits are what you do to make your employees lives more efficient and better right perks are just fun things right but i think both of them are important for example we have a proximity benefits we we believe that travel to and fro office is one of the biggest wastes of time right and so we actually pay half the rent for anyone that stays within 30 minutes of our office and it's it's just a free perk right so we want to make sure that i mean a free benefit this is it's not a perk right because a perk is like we have a bhel wala that comes in every monday to make mondays less gloomy we have a masseur and a physiotherapist because you play a lot of sports as well with the office people but it's very important to get benefits right which actually positively impact your employees and their families and their life and i think it's very important to have that culture for example we have a policy where you have to pay 50 rupees every time you say sir madam or ji you're not allowed to use that in office and that's because by using sir madam or ji we believe that you are empowering the other person and setting them up in a pedestal where you cannot challenge them and we want the exact opposite of that most of many of our best ideas have come from the lowest rung and when you set up a culture where there's you know you need to set up a culture where the lowest rung can challenge the ceo in an open meeting and so that's just a few of the things that we do but i think that so harsh uh, harsh you owe me 150 rupees you've called me sanjeev ji three times on this call i know but we're not in office <laughs> that's totally uh, no no i i know i know i i totally agree but i'm not here to challenge you <laughs> no but i think these well, are important to get the culture right i love this notion of scaling culture as, as your differentiator right i mean that's really really a powerful thing and also this this notion of the you know paying 50% of the rent my god that's a it's a very very powerful signal um, yeah uh, i must uh, so harsh i just really did want to compliment you right because i think that's a very unique and it's it's needed and it goes back to the earlier days remember when the industrial or the corporate houses used to build those colonies That's for right. the employees and their attrition rate actually used to be very low it was it didn't matter what the cash was right so i think i you know i think it's a very powerful benefit as you call it in today's uh, age and much needed yeah i think like our attrition has been about 3 or 4% every year as compared to yeah the- that's remarkable that like is usually about 35 40% in bangalore mumbai is lesser but you know we're really happy because i think this this whole like um especially in tech this attrition i think it kills you like having this knowledge transfer every year losing one third of your workforce and then moving around the whole time it's really destroys a lot of lot of value so but yeah okay and now i'm going to turn to you as as your former sort of strategy consultant right they say you know culture eats strategy for breakfast so now as you're working to shift the culture of many many organizations right because you know you're working with many many different companies of of all different kinds of sizes and shapes what do you find is most effective and i'm just staying with the culture thread right what is most effective in shifting a culture that they harsh had the opportunity of building a culture many companies don't have that luxury of to shift the culture what do you do what do you see is working in that yeah um i i think nosher as you said you know um, i have again had the opportunity to work with so many organizations and don't ask me for names but you know i've actually seen culture eat strategy for breakfast live right where there were companies which were promising everything was great but just because of some cultural issues they weren't able to deliver to the potential right so i truly truly believe in that i think going back to if i reflect of course there's no easy answers i've at least seen two things uh, which i think differentiated the ones who were able to deliver on culture versus not by the way what was common was everyone spoke about culture all organizations speak about culture all organizations do town halls in today's day and age all organizations do training workshops have vision mission statements right so i think for me that is actually not the differentiator i think it was it, it's boiled down to two things one is just the actually the leaders culture himself or herself right what they stand for i think the organization starts to mimic that and how truly passionately the leader believes in driving culture in the organization right so is it truly agenda point number 1 or is it post numbers and post financials you know yeah maybe i'll also do a town hall uh, in a month once and just go and say hello to the employees so i think 
the commitment of the leader to culture is has been the one uh, one and the second one is you know harsh spoke about culture for hiring appraisals and firing again most organizations i've seen are very good at applying culture on hiring many are very bad at applying it on performance management and uh, firing you know if you have a pers- leader who has demonstrated business impact but has serious cultural issues are you going to be able to pull the plug and i think that is where when the rubber hits the road many organizations say well you know it's okay you know i'm sure it can be worked on we'll give the person feedback right so i think for me it's two things one is the leader's commitment and the second one is do you follow through with actually taking culture into performance management and most importantly firing if need be fantastic we're getting a whole stream of questions coming in so i'm going to actually pick up the pace now i'm going to ask kamal a question quickly and then maybe we'll do if we have time we'll do one more round and then go to questions uh, or we may just go straight to questions so kamal you run one of the largest learning institutions organization systems in the world right now and and anya talked a lot about leaders walking the talk right what have you found which is really surprised you in terms of what leaders or any or generally what are people learning in this pandemic that you think has really surprised you or you know said hmm i wouldn't have expected that yeah so uh, thanks again i think um, very interesting discussion so far on culture one of the things we have observed during pandemic and and this kind of has been said before is this uh, work from home and many people believe that this reason we are so successful with work from home transition is simply because we have worked previously together what would be the long term impact as still to be calibrated and i believe truly that it's going to be a more of a hybrid model so it is not surprising that some of the content that got consumed during this covid was really around uh, working virtually that's not a surprise you will be surprised that there's still so much focus on time management there's still focus on business continuity planning people were still looking at you know you had like 56 uh, business continuity plans and then you have the 57th covid happened basically who could have planned for that so i think um, at at the leadership level you are trying to mitigate some of those risks uh, and you're looking at how do you calibrate the risk for the future and how do you mitigate those um and and planning is the key to that so most of the content most of the calibrations that we have seen most of the learning demands that have come in have been in areas of virtual team management culture management i think that's particularly true for mncs but uh where people have to work cross culture i i talked about team management virtually time management uh, you'll be surprised that time management has been something which we have been talking about for decades but it never really took off but now with this work from home it has suddenly come in the forefront one thing one more thing that i am really present to see and happy to observe is that for the largest period of time having worked for more than 28 years now in corporates i have seen things like mental health employee wellness and all the programs that you talk about it was little bit of a lipstick on the pig i mean it was more you know a tick box and checklist that you prepare and you just tick the boxes basically so i think in this times i saw genuine leadership concerns genuine intent not only for employee wellness uh, programs that run for health and programs that were running for mental health and etc but i also saw communities and socials and groups coming together that the purpose was not only purely profit but to make impact i think there is lot of good things that have happened in this last 9 months as well so we may see we may go back to our normal selves that as sanjeev said but what i believe truly is that yes some of these changes that we have seen will have a lasting impact when and even though we may get back to our offices we will at best be at a hybrid state where some of the impact of what we have gone through for the last 9 months will play a more lasting role uh, in our uh, job and work for the future so and lastly i want to talk about unconscious bias that continues to be one of the things that's still playing a very very important part along with diversity and inclusion so i know i wanted to cover quite a few topics there but 
you got some. No, no, it's it's absolutely true. Uh, we we I think every institution is struggling with unconscious bias and uh, diversity inclusion. All of these topics, I think, they are coming to the forefront uh, uh, in, in multiple ways. I think on a personal note, I think you know, as uh, I think Sanjeev was saying earlier, I took up uh, I took up coding after 25 years. I went back and not because I'm going to be the world's greatest coder by any chance, but because I was, uh, my daughter was looking at it, and I said, "Hey, I'll take a course with you." And uh, of course, you know, we won't, we won't uh, have any prizes for getting who beat who on the course, uh, <laughs> hands down, if I might say, right? But uh, but it was just fun. It was a fun experience to do with your family as well, right? When you're learning new skills. Indeed, uh, Sanjeev, I want to, I want to come to you, which is there's a question from Rakesh Roy. Uh, you mentioned you onboarded 87 employees, uh, you know, during the pandemic and so on. And a lot of people oh, 87, asking, 87 okay, engineers, freshers from campus. Freshers from campus, right? And and sort of sort of at the more tactical end of this discussion, because we've talked a lot about cultural learning, leadership, and so on. Uh, the question was, how do you manage onboarding really effectively? You know, it's uh, you've got to be innovative, but it's over video, right? It's over video. It's over Zoom. Nobody's meeting and uh, so the talk that HR gives, you give over video. You know, but there there isn't the tea break, coffee break, you know, lunch break where you're hanging out together. There isn't a evening thing, you know, where you're hanging out together. The, you know, uh, the, the talk that business heads, function heads give, they give a video. So there is a half induction, a three quarters induction, but there isn't a hundred percent induction, right? In that sense, the way it used to be. We're still learning. Maybe next time we'll have innovated by then if we, if we still require gluten video, right? And, and done some other stuff, you know? Because uh, I think planning group activities or video are possible, but you know we didn't have time to sort of think for those things. We were still sort of scrambling, right? But over time, but you know we have learned other organizations are also doing doing stuff like this, and we I guess we learn from them as well. So it's a kind of half induction, and then when the guys on the job, it becomes a slightly harder thing to supervise, right? For the supervisor. You know, I can't help but reflect back. I think Harsh, you said this early on, right? Which is uh, for for those of us who've been in an institution or in some institution for some time. It's easier for us because we have established networks, we know people and so on. So the induction is not as as, de- as difficult. I was struck by, you know, our, our global MD, Kevin Sneeder, was telling me he was in New York the other day. And for the first time, this is October, it was in October when he told me that our business analyst class of 2020 were for the first time meeting each other, right? which, is, which is unheard of, right? And how do you create that culture in, in that time? So just to turn, you know, to a different part of this conversation, Harsh, you know, th- this has also been a crisis in many ways, right? This, these last nine months have not been easy for people. And you've seen the toll on mental health. You've seen the stress on family life. You've seen, you know, as, as somebody said, there's, there's long days and short weekends, right? That's, that's effectively what happened. But in every crisis, there is a series of opportunities, right? And as you look forward into 2021, what are the big opportunities you see ahead of you as, as you look from a Dream, Dream 11 perspective? What are your plans for the future that you're excited about? Well, I think um, generally we've been, we've been building Dream 11 for about 13 years now. And now that it's got to, you know, I like saying in India, product market fit in the sports industry is like getting five crore people on your platform, right? Now we've got about 10 crore people. Now we're well on our way beyond our early majority users. And so we're now looking to work much more on the sports industry as a whole. We believe that still, you know, 99% of revenue of India in sports comes only from cricket. And there's so many other sports and they're all starting to take off now. India needs to be multi-sports. India needs to be much more personalized on content, on commerce to do with sports. Um, I'm sure Ananya has looked at this and Mintra as well at some point. The sports commerce market doesn't exist apart from the, you know, 200, 100 rupee, 200 rupee fake t-shirts you get on the road. It's, it's, it's a joke a bit. It's a, it's a bit of a joke, right? The sports industry, it's as personal as you can get, right? I'm still a Manchester United fan for all the last five years of pain that I've suffered after in Manchester United. I'll be a Manchester United fan forever. But I think apart from India cricket, right? The Indian men's cricket rather, nothing else really is working well, right? ISL has been growing, PKL has been growing and a bunch of leagues. But I think as, a, as an organization, we're evolving from Dream 11 to Dream Sports to being a company that looks at taking these 10 crore users that we have and saying, okay, how do we personalize your sports experience for you? 
how do we add value to your sports experience we're not a gaming company a lot of people get this wrong right we're a sports engagement company uh, we have nothing to do with gaming this is based on real life gaming is simulation right we're based on a real life event and so we're focused on solving for the sports fans personalizing their content their commerce their experiences their travel everything around sports and so that's our next evolution and our simple tagline is to make sports better wow simple and powerful i have a question from ramprasad shrinivas and i think i it's directed to you which is will work from home now become no, the norm in dream 11 absolutely not i have made it very loud and clear even to our colleagues that first of all i think the, i think there's two camps of people i'd like to say right one camp is where people really love working at dream 11 and i'll just speak about my company it may be true about others the other camp is like they love working at dream 11 in the dream 11 office as well the other one is the first one i'll refer to is people who love working with us but they don't have to work physically because they have parents aged parents or family or whatever need they have to be in a different city unfortunately i don't think that works right the minute we have a vaccine and a cure we're starting to enforce that you have to be back at office working together and that is really putting culture above everything else i think that right now people are you know the feeling that i get is that everyone's like mercenaries right you log in you get your work done and you log out right even this panel for example we would be talking for half an hour before the panel we'd get to know each other a little bit more right now we're just logging in getting the panel done and then logging out right there's no chit chat there's no meeting other people who are attending and i think that people are getting burnt out i think the the lines are completely blurred there's 10 pm calls there's 11 pm calls there's 8 am calls nobody respects work anymore and your mind space never moves right earlier it used to be like your mind space was at work and when you come home you can be on your calls etc but your mind space is not at work i think this will just lead to a massive burnout if people continue just working from home the whole time you know you're very true you're very true i mean we can see the calls to mental health health lines and so on go through the roof uh, you know you've seen you know stress and family divorce rates going up i mean there's a lot of things i mean aside from all the tragedy that this pandemic has caused uh, the real people tragedy i think there is a mental tragedy which is silent and which is actually extending quite a lot so as much as we talk up you know these new models of working there is only so much that humans as a race do without social contact uh nishir i can add that you know i used to work in japan and i spent a lot of time there mental health was one of the largest cost for corporates in japan across right so if you do a little bit of study there so it's absolutely an epidemic and it is going to we haven't calibrated again what is the impact what are the economic impact or the corporate impact etc but but that's something that uh, is the work to be done you know uh, i was right. talking to i was talking to a well a young entrepreneur actually so they were an industry colleague and he said sanjeev up to there is no work life balance there is only work life integration you know i mean it's it's all merged into one indeed so ananya we're going to ask you to lift us out of our despair so as you look forward to 2021 what excites you what plans are you making uh, assuming the vaccine is here as and we predicted by june july hopefully we are all free uh, in some way shape or form what what are your most exciting plans that you're making with uh, with your company yeah i think personally i'm just excited to start meeting people in person right so i think that's something i'm definitely looking forward to but yeah i think uh, from our company's perspective i guess all my colleagues on the panel have spoken about it it's how do you keep the good from 2020 and discard the bad and that will take very thoughtful action by the leaders i fully agree with kamal when he was saying the long term consequences of extending some of the operating models haven't been thought through and therefore you know while it's very easy for some organizations to say yes we will do work from home forever right there are biases built in on the fact that can all you do all your employees have the infrastructure and the personal space at home to be able to deliver right is the questions about is it the obligation of a corporate to actually provide for a space for you to be productive right similarly on the we spoke about culture we spoke about all of that right so while we started the panel with saying all the good right we became more efficient we are doing much more meetings people have been able to balance their work and personal priorities sometimes better we also see it's come at a cost 
and i think what i am really looking forward to is a discourse and debate with all the companies that we partner with to say okay what is the good that we want to continue and what is the bad which we actively want to discard uh, right so that's at least uh, my uh, two pence and that's it and that's it so we're coming up to the end of this this panel as harsh said we've been enormously efficient and we've been not entirely personal so i want to actually get a little bit more personal or at least have the opportunity to get a little bit more personal which is we have a thousand entrepreneurs i think on this viewing this right now and many more which may view it offline data from all the way from singapore to new york and others so as the sun sets behind me in mumbai if i could ask uh, each of our panel members to say what is the one piece of advice that you think is most valuable from what either someone taught you or you learned yourself What's your one piece of advice you would give to your budding entrepreneur friend, or your budding entrepreneur self of earlier years uh, today? And maybe Sanjeev, since you have the most experience, I'll start with you. Okay, so I will a couple of things. First is what I say to entrepreneurs generally, uh, you know, irrespective of COVID, which is that look, uh, in my view, the customer's money is better than the investor's money because if you're getting the customer's money and you're getting it repeatedly and you're getting it at a price that's higher than your cost, right? Chances are you have a viable business so long as you can get enough customers. And if you're getting the customer's money, uh, the investor's money will almost certainly come should you need it and want it because investors love to invest behind businesses that are getting customer money. On the other hand, getting the investor money first gives no guarantee that you'll get the customer's money and therefore build a viable business because the customer is unforgiving. The customer, you know, you will buy a second time. and the third time only if it worked for him the first time and the investor may be impressed by a powerpoint by a thesis proposition whatever you know across the table and you made a good pitch and they might cut a check and they you know it's about impressing two people three people so the customer's money is much more important than the investor's money that's why i said to entrepreneurs generally in covid times i'd say look be fearful and bold at the same time be fearful that look demand has vanished demand may vanish uh, you know capital may vanish you know at the same time you can't sit still right you got to figure out where the opportunities are and make some moves okay and cash <laughs> is king especially at this time so conserve cash either by cutting cost conserve you know or by increasing you know create cash by increasing revenue and you know if you can get investor money get it as always but cash is king fantastic cash is king conserve you know and uh, bold moves really make a difference ananya what would you Yeah, I think I just want to actually underscore uh, two points of what Sanjeev said. Right, one is I absolutely cash is king. There is no substitute for cash flows, uh, and I think this time has shown us. We've also shown, seen different investors move to back to the traditional thinking. Right, so I think that is one for sure. And I think the other one is make tough decisions. I, you know, the worst that can happen is you'll be wrong, but at least you won't have lost. a big opportunity so those are the two also to sanjeev to your point i did want to say that it some investors money is better than other investors so to your point <laughs> of customer money and investor money well as since you're the only investor on this panel you know i i will agree with you because we also <laughs> invest <laughs> all right now we're through endorsing what would you say what's your one piece of advice one sentence of advice i would say uh, maybe two or three uh, basically First of all, I'm a great believer in imagination begets the event. So I would like people to continue dreaming. That is my first task. In spite and despite of all the bad things that have happened. Number two is that uh, failing fast is a gift. Customer feedback is a gift. Okay. So you need to take that gift. If you have to fail fast, fail and repivot the business and move on and consider that as a gift. Secondly, uh, customer. is the cash is king but the customer is also the king please uh, listen to your customer customer centricity never is outdated or irrelevant so those are the two things from my side that's it thank you harsh yeah i would say that you know focus on solving one large problem that you are extremely passionate about right i think focus is highly underrated people either want to you know launch something and then they want to expand either horizontally or vertically or geographically and they feel like unless you know globally having offices in new york and hong kong and mumbai and paris and whatever you're not successful they measure success by the number of employees you have rather than the revenue per employee i think you need to focus on one problem we are very fortunate in india especially to have a large domestic market and not enough people i think focus on that domestic market and getting that one large problem and being the king of that one large problem and that you have to be super passionate about it 
if you're not passionate please don't ride a wave right please don't do something just because it's a cool new thing to do do something that you're going to outlast when everyone else gives up you'll be standing as well right you'll still be standing still be fighting still be waking up and going to sleep thinking about that problem i think that's very very important and like kamal mentioned failing right somehow in our lifetime we forget that you only succeed through failure right like we're born and we fall and we fall and we fall and that's how we learn to walk and we drown and that's how we learn to swim but through our educational journey somehow we are put into this mindset that failure is horrible that you're a failure it's like a derogatory negative word right but i believe that the only way you can succeed is to constantly fail and keep failing fail fast keep pivoting keep learning the only thing we should look at is try not having failures which kill us right but like the song says as well right that It doesn't kill you only It makes you stronger right yeah. so that's all i'll say no no good and i think i'll just add one more to mine which is an extension of what harsh said at the end which is uh, stay humble uh, there's a lot that the last year has taught us right the fact is that most of us are pretty helpless to march april and may right yeah if i can yeah. add that covid has taught us to be more human and more digital exactly and when the demand comes back when hopefully investor money is uh, start coming in the order that ananya has prescribed when you know demand returns when your customers come back when your valuations go back up remember you know some part of it is down to the people that are around you a large part of it is around the people around you and whether you are the ceo or the or the janitor you make a difference by staying humble and listening to the customer Thank you very much. With that, let me hand back to the Asen Fa- uh, Foundation with a big, big thank you to our panel. It's been a fantastic conversation, uh, taking us through multiple topics. Sanjeev, Arsh, Ananya, and Kamal, I can't thank you so much on behalf of the Asen Foundation. And maybe with that, uh, Arjuna, I'll hand back to you and the team there. Thank you.